Welcome to the Australian Hiker Podcast, Australia's longest running hiking podcast downloaded over three quarters of a million times in over 160 countries and providing you with an Australian perspective on all things hiking. We're your hosts, Tim and Jules Savage, coming to you from Ngunnawal and Nambri country. This is episode 262 of the Australian Hiker Podcast. And in this week's episode, we talk about hiking in arid environments. We hope you enjoy. Before we get into today's episode, if you'd like to help support Australian Hiker and this podcast, there are a couple of ways that you can help us out. Firstly, by subscribing on your podcast host of choice so that each episode is available as soon as it's published. And if you have the opportunity, leave us a five-star review. Another way to support us is go to the Australian Hiker website at www.australianhiker.com.au and click on the supporters page and buy us a coffee. You can do a one-off donation or become a monthly supporter. All donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue producing this podcast and blog. Now let's get on to today's episode. Now I'm a fan of hiking in drier regions, preferring this type of landscape to the wetter locations of the southern and coastal Australia that many hikers prefer. While the practice of planning hikes is the same no matter where you are, there are some specific considerations that hiking in semi-arid and arid regions of Australia require. In this podcast episode, we look at what some of these are. Now before we go into the details, we need to define what arid hiking is. Now, Australia is the driest inhabited continent in the world, with 70% of our land mass classed as either semi-arid or arid land. And let's look at what those terms mean. The semi-arid zones are areas which receive an average rainfall of between 250 and 350 millimetres of rain uh, on an annual basis. Arid zones are defined as areas which receive an average of 250 millimetres of rainfall or less. So with both those, it's not a lot of rain, really, with what we're used to. As a generalisation, one thing to note is that many arid and semi-arid regions typically have two seasons rather than the four, and that's pretty much down to wet season and dry season. And rather than having small amounts of rain on a weekly or a monthly basis, uh, averaging out over the year, some months will often tend to be very wet and others will tend to be very dry. In fact, these regions will often get the majority of their rainfall over a relatively short period. When most people think about arid and semi-arid regions, they automatically think heat or hot weather, and in most cases you'd be right. But if you've ever been to this type of environment before, you may not be aware that extreme ranges of temperature can occur from not just the hot but also down to the very cold. And over the duration of this podcast, we'll use as an example the Larapinta Trail, which is a probably be- Australia's best-known arid region hiking trail uh, in the Northern Territory, covering a distance of roughly around about 230 kilometres in length. So we did the Larapinta Trail in August of 2016, and for us that was the first official hike of Australian Hiker. And over the 14 days, we had temperatures as high as 32 degrees Celsius, and as low as zero degrees Celsius, and sometimes on the same day. <laughs> so yeah, a, a pretty big range of extremes. I remember talking to some hikers that had actually done the walk around about 10 days beforehand, and they had temperatures going down to minus four degrees Celsius and up to 32. So again, it's quite a big range. Now, that's 36 degrees of temperature. can make quite a difference to how you see and how you view the hike you're on. So really from a planning perspective, you need to plan for hot weather, but you also need to plan for sub-zero temperatures as well. Usually you'll find in coastal conditions or, or areas that aren't so arid or dry, you know, you do get the hot temperatures still, uh, but quite often at night time, the night time temperatures might be 10, 12, 15, 18 degrees. So, you know, it's, there is a range, but there's not the extreme range. And you're not having to cater for this wide variety of conditions. So as funny as it may seem, you're hiking in the desert or, or a dry environment. You're, you've got 32 degrees during the, da- the daytime and you're using a fairly warm rated sleeping bag to cater for the conditions at night. That brings us on to our next topic, and that's layering. 
We did a survey a number of years ago, and the majority of people use a four-layered system. And that's essentially a rain jacket, puffy jacket of some sort, a warmer long sleeve top, and a short sleeve top or a, a thinner long sleeve top underneath that. I think I have the five layer system because mm-hmm. <laughs> I also have a, a singlet that I would wear. And yeah, and some people do have five layers and some only work with three. So whatever works for you, really that's that's what you need to go for. One thing about a layering system is rather than just having one garment that's going to keep you toasty and warm when it's cold but make you really hot uh, when it, when the temperatures get up there, you need the ability to mix and match your layers, wear whatever suits you and whatever you're comfortable with, uh, to match the conditions that you're actually walking in. So again, coming back to the layer of pender trail, it wasn't unusual for us on most days, but not all, where we'd have – zero degree temperatures or, or or only just above zero degrees in the morning and starting to walk in a puffy jacket. And within an hour or two, we'd strip that jacket off and we'd gotten down to just a single layer uh, because the temperatures had increased quite dramatically. Yeah. And it wasn't a thick pack, puffy jacket, but, it, you know, with the layers, it was enough. And with that temperature, um, it was needed. So uh, I, don't, I can't remember one morning when it wasn't needed. Now... Both Jill and I, and particularly myself, are probably a bit less common than most people I see on trail, (laughs) uh, in that most people will often wear T-shirts rather than a long sleeve base layer. And for me, the only time I tend to wear a T-shirt is probably in spring and autumn when I'm hiking at five o'clock in the morning. And for me, that's a comfortable sort of level of, of what I'm wearing. And also for a short hiking period, um, short day hikes. And for me to wear a T-shirt, it, the walk's got to probably be about an hour or two at most. Anything mm-hmm. longer than that, I'm wearing a long sleeve top. And it's particularly important in arid conditions because it is so easy to get sunburned. It's a it's a real trap sometimes. You think, okay, it's not that hot, but you know, it creeps up on you and all of a sudden you realise your shoulders are burnt or your arms are burnt or the backs of your hands are burnt. So it's better to have a long sleeve, fairly thin top uh, that protects your arms to a great extent. Yeah, and it's interesting on uh, Lara Pinta because I, I didn't get burnt over those 14 days, but when I look back at the photos and particularly the very last photo, we're at the end trail head. I was a very, very dark colour and I didn't realise um, how brown that I'd gotten over that period of time despite being covered up. We were talking about tops, but also need to look at the bottoms as well. So I have seen people on trails like Lara Pinta where they're wearing shorts and gaiters and they've got about a three-inch gap of skin in the middle, uh, which I don't quite get. I like to wear long pants. Again, it's for a sunburn is probably one of the main reasons. But the other issue is as well is there is lots of spiky plants, spinifex up in the Northern Territory. And yes, you can wear gaiters and get away with that. But, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing that having protection from the sun, having protection from snakes, having protection from spinifex, they're all a justification for wearing long pants. The other thing that you need to consider as well as part of the layering system, which is not necessarily to do with warmth, but a bit more to do with sun protection, is a hat, of a, a decent quality hat that's going to give you... Um, a wide brim. Wide brim. I must admit, I do own some Akubra hats. Uh, in fact, I actually collect hats, but I don't wear them that often. I find they can, they can blow off. Uh, and even the broad brimmed hats that have uh, an under chin tie on them just don't give you enough sun protection on the neck and the back of your head, particularly if you don't have much hair. So I I tend to wear the, for want of a better term, the dorky looking hats that we wear. <laughs> uh, that that ha- you wear. Yeah, that, are, that are broad brim from the side, that have a cape that comes down the back of the neck, a lightweight and, and a good drawstring on them to cope with uh, very windy conditions and aren't going to blow off. And again, those sort of hats tend to be uh, the ideal. I think, you know, I, I wear them so I, and I can say I think I look dorky in them. Uh, but, you know, they're, they really are the best option for hats. Peaked hats, not going to provide you a lot of protection, again, if you don't have much hair. If you have mm-hmm. lots of hair to protect you, different issue. 
Uh, but again, my case is not going to not going to help me too much. Yeah, and that um, string under your chin—that's um, probably the, the 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 most dorky piece of you know feature on 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 a hat. But absolutely essential when you're in open arid areas or when you're on uh, high ridges in arid areas. Because on Lara Pinta, I didn't have a string under my chin, and my hat blew away so many times to the point that I put it in my pocket. (laughs) Now, in addition to things like hat, obviously sunglasses to protect you from any glare, which is often the case, particularly in very open regions through a lot of the arid areas of Australia. And also a lightweight fingerless lycra glove of some sort. And for me, I find that I use tracking poles on most hikes. And when you're using tracking poles, your hands tend to be almost flat with the top part of your hands being more exposed on a regular basis. So it's not hard or it's not uncommon to get sunburn on the back of your hands. And I just find the Lycra fingerless gloves tend to be ideal for that. Or if you're not a fan of that sort of thing, a long sleeve top that has the thumb loops uh, with the the lightweight material going over the back of your hands. And that'll also do the same job as well. Still on the topic of things like tops, um, having a collar there uh, to keep you uh, protected around the neck. And if you haven't got a collared top, an additional lightweight buff that sits around your neck and protects the base of your neck, where particularly where you you find the hat's not quite covering as well as you would like. Yeah, and sometimes when the you head in a different direction, so you you angle differently to the sun, you can't rely on your hat covering up all the bits around your neck. Now, moving on from layering and clothing, we talked about temperatures as well. Uh, taking it to the other end is avoid the extreme heat. Hiking in th- temperatures for me above twenty five degrees and higher does sort of cause me a bit of. That's a, that's it, hot for you. It, it, it is hot for me. I I do much better in cold conditions rather than I do in hot conditions. Um, and even though I do hike in hot conditions from time to time, I prefer to start the day early to avoid the most of the heat. So it's not unusual and really hot. You know, if I know the day is going to be hot, uh, to be up and hiking at about 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, sun may not be up for another couple of hours. I can get a good run at my daily distance that I've, that I've set for myself. And if need be, I can have a, a bit of a break during the middle of the day uh, to avoid the worst of the heat and then hi- start hiking again a bit later on uh, in the afternoon or evening. And this is where night hiking comes in. Uh, there's nothing wrong with night hiking, and I love night hiking if the conditions are good. Now, where I say good here, it's going to depend on a number of things. There are some areas on the Larapinta Trail which is covered in rocks where I wouldn't hike at night time because it's just so easy to trip with because you're not going to see the rocks you're stepping around or over. Or we had one area where we had to work our way down a gully. Doing that at night time is not the easiest <laughs> thing in the world. And even doing it during the day, I got my hiking poles caught between some rocks and and went to step away and fell over. So I could see and I still still didn't make it. So the other thing with night hiking as well is that um, you want to, I mean, as I mentioned, you want to have a reasonably flat, even sort of trail. Uh, you don't want to be walking along the edge of a, a, a drop a cliff. off or a cliff, yeah. <laughs> oh. um, you're better off doing that during the daytime. And you want to have a decent torch that's going to provide a fair amount of power uh, to make wayfinding easy. Um, decision is yours. Some people just don't like night hiking. Uh, but when the opportunity is there and it's a lot cooler, you know, walking two or three hours into the night means you can avoid the excess heat during the daytime. From there, we move on to water, and this is one of the big things with hiking in arid or semi-arid regions. When you're hiking in areas, say, like Tasmania, it's extremely unlikely that you're not going to come across water on a fairly regular basis. So it means you don't have to carry huge quantities of water. You can top up every hour or so as you go, and you know if you feel like it, you can virtually carry almost no water and drink as you go. With a lot of arid regions, that's not really an option. So again, Larapinta Trail, there are water tanks at the campsites that you can top up from. There are some water sources along the trail, uh, but they're not always reliable. 
But if you think of things like uh, Ellery Creek as an example, there's uh, they, they use that uh, picture in a lot of the promotional images showing people standing in the water. It is bitterly cold. It's almost icy, the water's so cold. Uh, but, you know, there are water sources along the trail. But we also did a, a two nights where we camped away from the designated campgrounds. One was probably within a, a kilometre or two of we filled up our water bladders uh, to, as we headed up the hill to our campsite. And if you have gone to the Australian Hiker website, that was at the location where we took the photo of Mount Sonder, uh, which is our cover image for our website, uh, but no water. So it means you're going to have to have enough water to do you for the evening and the morning until you get to your next campsite. The other campsite was on Brinkley Bluff. Uh, and again, there was no water probably from around about mid-afternoon to roughly around about just before lunch the next day. Mm -hmm. So we pretty much needed almost 24 hours of water, uh, which means topping up uh, before we went up to the top of the hill uh, because there was no alternative. The problem with a lot of arid and semi-arid regions is quite often the water sources aren't reliable. If you know you've got guaranteed water, like Ellery Creek as an example, uh, you can rely on that. Uh, but there's a lot of other areas where you just can't rely on it and have to work on the basis that you're going to have to carry water. Now, drinking the right amount of water is also something to keep an eye on. It's, it's no good just carrying it and not drinking it. For me, if the temperatures are below roughly around about 20 degrees, I'll drink about one litre of water for each 10 kilometres that I walk. And that's around about half a litre per hour, roughly. In hot weather, so conditions probably over 25 degrees, I'd say, uh, I'll drink two and a half litres per 10 kilometres. Uh, and as an example, on my biggest day ever of hiking, which was around about 58 kilometres, I drank about eight and a half litres of water uh, over the duration of the day. Now, it was roughly around about 14 hours of hiking, but that's still uh, a fair amount of water. Uh, but the, the temperatures were 37 degrees. Uh, and that wasn't on Lara Pinta. No, that wasn't on Lara Pinta. And you Pinter. weren't carrying a full pack. <laughs> no, no, and it wasn't. It was really, but the bulk of my weight really was water sources. Uh, and I knew that I could get water as I was walking or stop into a shop to pick up something to drink. Normally, if you're hiking in, in the hot conditions, you do what's called cameling up and you drink uh, uh, a half litre or a litre before you start your hike for the day. That raises the other issue of drinking too much water. Yeah, so, I mean, we don't often think about this, but uh, it is possible to drink too much water and um, the difficulty of that is that the signs and symptoms or the early signs and symptoms of too much water, uh, which are headaches, nausea and vomiting, um, can be quite similar to heat stress and heat, heat exhaustion. So, you know, you, you get a bit confused and then you think, oh, well, I haven't had enough, so I'll drink drink more. But the way to think about it is that, I mean, Tim mentioned that, you know, he drank roughly about half a litre of water an hour uh, when, when it was quite hot. If you're starting to drink any more than that, the difficulty is that your kidneys can't expel more than you know, 800 to a litre of water in an hour. So, you know, if if uh, you're drinking much more than that, then you are at risk of, I guess, suffering from drinking too much water. Now, from my perspective, drinking water is one of those sort of things that you do it when it's easy. I have always been a water bladder user. Uh, I just find that I will drink more regularly if I've got to reach around to the side of my pack to get a bottle out, to have a sip of water, to then put the water bottle back in the side of the pack, uh, I tend not to drink as much water as I would if I was carrying a bladder. Now, taking an opposite view here, having water bottles as your source, these days you can buy a one and a half litre water bottle, so potentially you could have one each side of the pack. That's three litres, which is the same as the bladder that I carry. Uh, and the advantage with the bottles is you can see or monitor your, how much water you have yeah, left. Yeah, that's right. Whereas for me with a bladder, I've got a good indication about how much water I drank and I'm keeping track of it, but I really don't know until all of a sudden I get a, I start sucking a bit of air that I know that I'm almost down to the, the end of the bladder and I've almost emptied the bladder out. 
Or you get to the end of the day and you think, oh, well, I'll top up my water and then you realise that you haven't really drunk enough. There are benefits to carrying water bottles as opposed to bladders as well. Now, still on the theme of water, flash flooding. And this is something that will often be be a consideration in arid regions. And it's something that many hikers tend not to think about. I'll use as an example, and this is a non-hiking example here, the TV show Survivor. When they came from the US to Australia a number of years ago to film Survivor, uh, they, they proceeded to set up camp in a dry riverbed. Uh, and sure enough... Uh, and it was by, nice and soft and sandy and, you know, perfect spot. Yeah, yeah. And Except. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and sure enough, by the end of the show, they'd had flash flooding and the camp had gotten washed away and they lost most of their food. So... I have seen people camping in dry creek beds or dry river beds in arid and semi-arid regions because the sand is soft and it is comfortable. There's no doubt about it. Uh, whereas for a lot of the Larapinta Trail, it's rock with a bit of soil. Uh, so it's, it's easier to get a more comfortable sleep in a sandy river bed. But the thing about the arid and semi-arid regions, as I mentioned before with the rainfall, quite often the rain is not consistent. You don't sort of get... Uh, 20 mils of rain per month to give you that 250 mils roughly of rain per year. You might get 100 to 150 mils of rain in one dump uh, and then have a couple of months of dry weather. A lot of Central Australia, not all, a lot of Central Australia is fairly flat uh, and it's like a giant sink. So you can get rain that might be 20 or 30 kilometres away. You know, you're in a nice dry area and, you know, you're getting 100 millimetres of rain 20 or 30 kilometres away, and it eventually it hits you, and it's, it's just a huge amount of water. So you go from a dry riverbed. Uh, so the Todd River, as an example, in Alice Springs, goes from being dry and sandy to being wet very quickly in most cases. So if you're going to go through and hike in arid and semi-arid regions, you don't have to camp on top of a hill, but you should camp on a higher spot. You shouldn't pick the lowest spot that you can find. And you're better off camping close to a dry riverbed uh, and you'll see where the vegetation is and you'll see where it's just sand and nothing else. That's where the water levels tend to be. So paying attention is one of those things you want to do on every hike you do, but particularly in their like relation to arid hiking, keep an eye on the forecast, see if there's any big storms forecast. Uh, and make sure you're in the right spot when you do camp at the end of the night. The other thing might be as well, typically when the water does rise so quickly, it tends to drop quickly as well. But you find if you've just a, just come to a riverbed that, and you've had torrential rain, you may find that you're not going to be able to cross it, and you might have to wait until the next morning before the water level's dropped. Now, we talked about the temperatures before, but learn to recognise negative impacts of heat. And hiking in the heat has the potential to be dangerous if you don't pay attention to what your body's telling you. And this is where you need to learn to recognise what it is uh, that your body is telling you and the impacts of heat so you know what to do. And common issues that can occur in hot conditions, sunburned as we've already mentioned. And you mentioned that uh, the backs of your hands getting sunburned but... And, and also uh, people wearing shorts and gaiters. If you've ever had sunburnt knees, you know that it's best to cover them up. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a killer. <laughs> dehydration. By the time you think, oh, I haven't been drinking enough water, you're already dehydrated. But it is, as Jill mentioned, it's a matter of balancing that out. You should be drinking regularly. If you're sweating profusely and you're not drinking water, uh, that's probably an indication you probably should be. But again, monitor your water consumption to make sure that you are drinking on a regular basis. Yeah, and this, the simple test for that is, you know, check the colour of your urine. Um, how much you're urinating, if it's not very much, that's a bit of an indicator, you're not drinking enough. And if it's, you know, your urine is supposed to be almost colourless, so, you know, anything beyond that, you need to top up with some water. Know what the symptoms of heat exhaustion and heat stroke are. And this is where doing a first aid course or upgrading your first aid training on a regular basis is important. Certainly heat exhaustion, and as we're recording this podcast, there are heat waves uh, in a lot of places around the world. So 
This is the sort of things that you need to be able to monitor and know what the symptoms are and know what to do about them. Wildlife and vegetation, every different type of environment and vegetation around the country or around the world has its own unique properties and characteristics. In relation to arid and semi-arid conditions, there are a couple of things that you need to be conscious of. Obviously snakes, but that can be an issue anywhere in the country. But you'll find that a lot of the arid regions tend to be very, I won't say grassy, but you know the spinifex, which looks like a grass, you, know, you can't really see into them and see what's there. You do need to pay attention to your path that you're walking on in case there's a snake that's decided to sun itself in the middle of the path. You need to pay attention to, if you are walking off trail, making sure you've got tracking poles uh, and you're blazing a trail with your poles, not just walking through and because you don't know what's there. Uh, so the poles are a way of just prodding the ground in front and startling any snakes that might be in front of you uh, if you are walking off the trail itself. The other thing to worry about in relation to creepy crawlies on trail are things like dingoes. And if you read the guidebook for the Alara Pinta Trail, they do warn you about dingoes on the trail. Now, we never saw any. I haven't come across people that have seen them. However, um, at some stage in the past, they've been there and they had a reputation for stealing shoes. Yeah, uh, I think just one, though, one out of a pair. <laughs> and if you think about it, those people that have got dogs, that for some reason they seem to like licking your feet, and I think it's because of the salt, the salt that's on your feet. Uh, and obviously the shoes tend to have the same attra- attraction, at least to them. So I must admit, I don't tend to leave my shoes out of the tent at night time. Or if I do, I make sure they're firmly attached to my pack and they can't be dragged off. So again, not so much of a problem about being attacked by a dingo, but more about what they're going to steal from you more yeah, than anything yeah, else. that's right, that's right. The other thing which can be, again, an Australian-wide thing is rodents or small animals that are going to try and steal food from you. This can be an issue in any part of the country, uh, but it, it's often a problem where you've had very wet conditions, the the mice and the, the small animals breed up, they're in big numbers, uh, then the, the, the rain dries out and the food dries out, and all of a sudden... They come to the only food source available, which is in your pack and in your tent. So this will be a subject of a further podcast uh, coming up in the future uh, where we do talk about protecting your pack and protecting your food from the the native wildlife. Yeah, and the year that we did uh, Lara Pinta, the mice were supposedly um, a big issue. Um, I'm not a fan of mice. Um, And so... Not so much for the dingoes, but for the mice. I did keep my boots in inside the tent because uh, the last thing I wanted to do was to put my foot on one as I went off uh, to walk in the middle of the night. And I also had my pack inside a dry bag as a bit of protection um, from rodents creeping in and, and so on. But we didn't have any problems at all. So you never know what you might find. Um, the reports in our case uh, weren't weren't uh, accurate. Moving on from wildlife into vegetation, as we mentioned, spinifex is fairly common in semi-arid and arid regions in central Australia. Uh, and it's if you haven't come across spinifex before, it's a bluey-green, grassy-looking sort of plant, uh, but it's extremely spiky. Uh, you do not want to fall on a spinifex plant. You will know about it. Uh, spinifex has the ability of being able to go through a pair of pants quite easily. Uh, you know, I'd wear long gaiters just to protect myself from spinifex, and certainly you want long pants. You don't want to be hiking in just shorts because that's not a good move. Uh, I had instances on the Larapenta Trail where I'd sit down on a rock, have a bit of a break. I'd put my hand down on what I thought was rock, and there was just some very stunted little spinifex plants, and I'd end up having to get the tweezers out to pick the bits of uh, plant that had gotten stuck into my hand. So it's the sort of thing that, again, normally plants can be an issue where you are, but spinifex really is an arid plant uh, and something you do need to be aware of. So if you are hiking off trail... Definitely long pants, definitely long gaiters. Just to it's protect so them. easy to pick it up, so easy to have it attached to your skin and then you just have to spend a heap of time trying to get it out and sometimes that becomes quite difficult. Okay. 
Okay, so just to finish off this podcast, my comment here would be, I am a big fan of hiking in arid and and semi-arid conditions, more so than hiking in, say, coastal or the southern Tasmanian type of vegetation. I prefer the dry vegetation. I prefer the drier conditions. uh, But that's a personal preference. One of the things I love about these landscapes is that you often get some really brilliant sunrises and sunsets. You often get some really great views. You get very different vegetation conditions and very different wildlife as well. For me, I have the belief that there are too many good long-distance trails to hike to go back and hike one a second time. My exception for that is the Larapenta Trail. That was the, as I said, the first hike we did when we'd gone through and uh, released Australian Hiker. And it's a trail that I want to go back and do again, uh, possibly in a different direction or possibly adding some additional distance to it because I just loved it so much. I think to get the best out of hiking in arid and semi-arid regions, you just need to change your style of hiking and make allowances for the unique conditions you're likely to experience. But in the end, so long as you've done your planning, it's well worth it. Okay, that's all for this week's episode. We hope you've enjoyed. Bye for now. And bye from me. And even during during it, and even during it, and even do oh jeez, the seri the seri <laughs> the semi arid zones. I have always been 